Hi, I'm Gabs, and today we're looking at Non Sum Quali Eram Bonnet Subregno Scenare by Ernest Dowson, and this is from the A level paper Love Through the Ages Syllabus. We're gonna look at the world that Ernest was living in, what made him tick, why he was such a sensual and radical writer for his time. We'll read the poem, we're gonna analyze the literary devices, and we'll dive into some form and structure. Firstly, let's look at the title and what it roughly translates to. I am not as I was in the reign of good Sonara, meaning I'm not as happy or as in my prime as I was when Sonara was my queen. Ultimately, this is a poem about his previous lover, the suffering about not being able to let them go and seeing them in everything you do. Let's look at some historical context. The decadent movement emerged in the 1890s. Self-indulgence, eroticism and rebelliousness were just a few of the radical themes woven throughout the movement. This horrified the Victorians. Traditionally, Victorians believed art and literature should promote ethics and morality, encouraging us to be virtuous. Nonetheless, many people saw the uncoupling of art and morality as dangerous. Decadence shook the Victorian establishment with its sensuality, sexual and political experimentation. But who was Ernest Dowson? Ernest Dowson's life was a tragedy. He was born in 1867 in London, became a key figure in the decadent movement, but by the age of 32, he died a penniless, alcoholic drug addict. Ironically, he spent his life writing about love and passion, but never seemed to have his love reciprocated. To top this Victorian soap opera off, both his parents died within six months of one another. His father died from a chloral hydrate overdose, and his mother committed suicide. As we read the poem, what feelings come up for you? How do these feelings inform the key themes of the poem? Some themes I picked up on were desire, sensuality, destruction and insanity, faithfulness and infidelity, shame, grief and loss. So as we read the poem, just kind of hone in on those themes and think about what their connotations are, what comes up for you. Non Sum Quali by Ernest Dowson. Last night, I, yesternight, betwixt her lips and mine, there fell thy shadow. Sainara, thy breath was shed upon my soul between the kisses and the wine. And I was desolate and sick of an old passion. Ye, I was desolate and bowed my head. I have been faithful to thee, Sainara, in my fashion. All night upon my heart I felt her warm heart beat, night long within mine arms in love and sleep she lay. Surely the kisses of her bought red mouth were sweet, but I was desolate and sick of an old passion. When I awoke and found the dawn was grey, I have been faithful to thee, Sonara, in my fashion. I have forgot much, Sonara, gone with the wind, flung roses, roses riotously with the throng, dancing to put thy pale lost lilies out of mind, but I was desolate and sick of an old passion, ye all the time, because the dance was long. I have been faithful to thee, Sonara, in my fashion. I cried for madder music and stronger wine, but when the feast is finished and the lamps expire, then falls thy shadow, Sonara, the night is thine and I am desolate and sick of an old passion, ye hungry for the lips of my desire. I have been faithful to thee, Sonara, in my fashion. Wow. It's as though he's channeling all these complex emotions, grief, loss, shame, lost. It's as though he's a time bomb and he's just waiting to go off, which he does. Firstly, we have a metaphor. There fell thy shadow, Sonara. While he's making love with a woman, Sonara appears, not in the flesh, but as a shadow. And a shadow has connotations of darkness and the unconscious mind. To numb his desire for Sonara, Dowson seeks intimacy, indulgence and joy. 
But regardless of his reckless philandering, Sonara is always there at the back of his mind. Sibilance is next, uh, the line shed upon my soul between the kisses. This sibilance speaks of sensuality. You can almost hear the bedsheets stirring and shifting as he, you know, makes love to this stranger. Dowson talks of his soul, as if there's a soul connection between him and Sonara, as if she is the only one who can speak to his soul. Even though he's engaged physically in an act of lovemaking, he's not present. Instead, he's thinking of Sonara and the soul connection he feels with her. Then we have an epimone, which is the repetition of a word, a phrase, or idea to encourage us to reflect on the phrase's larger message. Now, the phrase here is, I was desolate and sick. It seems this sort of unrequited love is something Dowson's reflected on continually and maybe even obsessively, and that's shown through the epimone. Look at the monosyllabic language in lines bowed my head. This could be interpreted two different ways. Firstly, the poem slows down here and he hangs his head at his recklessness as though he's acknowledging his shame and guilt. On the other hand, a bowed head relates to religion and prayer. Maybe he's praying to God to save his soul. And the monosyllabic choice of words capture the monotonous doom and dread he feels. Finally, we have the exclamatory. Notice whenever the name Sonara appears, it comes with an exclamation mark, as if the sound of her name causes him pain and grief. You know, he has to shout it. It's forceful, yet still. There's so much uh, satisfying rhyme in the first two lines of this stanza. Look at the words heart, warm, arm, and then beat and sleep. It's quite satisfying and it's almost describing that in this moment of lovemaking, Dowson is fulfilled for a second. He revels in the sensuality of his post lovemaking state. He acknowledges the stranger's kisses were sweet, but they meant nothing. This is a nice little segue into the metaphor. Her mouth is bored, which implies she's a sex worker. Sex work wasn't uncommon during the Victorian times, but writing a poem about sleeping with a sex worker was. <laughs> Many Victorians would have judged him as disgraceful and insanely radical. And I'm wondering whether one of the reasons the poem did so well is because so many respectable men at the time had mistresses. And then we have some sibilance. But I was desolate and sick of an old passion. Notice the line has repeated from stanza one. Therefore, this reoccurrence means Dowson wants us to reflect heavily on this line. If we break it down even more, look at the word desolate. It's defined as bleak, an empty place, or a feeling that is unhappy and wretched. You can hear the sting in the sharp S sound. His shame and grief rears its head as though he's chastising himself for being stuck in this destructive pattern of behavior, getting drunk and sleeping around. Pathetic fallacy is where the weather reflects the mood of a piece of literature to encourage the reader to connect and empathize with what's happening here. The dawn was gray, creates a despairing atmosphere. The dawn is supposed to be bright, inspire hope and the promise of a new day and new opportunities. But Dowson's mind is clouded. There's no sun, no hope, only heartache. We have a metaphor, gone with the wind. Dowson's referencing his unpredictable behavior, how he's been carried away in the wind. While this could be interpreted as a somewhat romantic and spontaneous behavior, it's also dangerous to never be in control, only a puppet to the elements. He lists all the things he's done to try and forget Sonara. He's danced, flung roses, gotten drunk, taken drugs, but none of this is helping. 
Take a look at the alliteration, for example. Roses riotously, the rolling R's are passionate yet frustrated and a little aggressive. Then another example of alliteration, lost lilies, but this is karma. It speaks of loss and grief. Typically, lilies are a flower that are seen at funerals. So they're a symbol of death. Maybe Sonora died, maybe their relationship died, but clearly he's mourning the loss of their relationship. And yet another metaphor, faithful. It has religious connotations and it's an interesting choice of word because Dowson's not been physically faithful because we know he's been sleeping around, but the irony is he's become a philanderer in order to distract from how faithful his mind remains to Sonara. Which is why he ends the sentence with, in my fashion. Basically, in Dowson's own unique way, he's been faithful to her. Alliteration again, madder music. The elongated M sound stresses the desperation in his voice. He's trying to drown out Sonara with the sound of music, strong wine, but no matter how drunk and senseless he gets, she still lingers. Alternate rhyme is the next thing, wine and thine. Such a powerful few lines. We feel the pace and the chaos of his philandering and partying in the first line. And then it's though he's trying to break free from Sonara's grip, but can't. To him, Sonara is relentless, all-consuming, so much so that she always comes and takes the night. The night is thine. The last few lines of stanza four are somewhat contradictory. On the one hand, he's sick of the memories of Sonara, how they make him fall into these destructive patterns of behaviour, yet he also yearns for her desperately. His desire is insatiable. There's a kind of cannibalistic hyperbole where he says, hungry for the lips of my desire, as though his infatuation is so powerful, it speaks to something primitive and animalistic, something that he can't override. Victorians had a fear of the primitive and base sexual desires. They prided themselves on being educated and civilized. The religious types like to believe that we were born from God, from the Garden of Eden, while the sciencey types embrace Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. This theory suggests that humans didn't evolve from the Garden of Eden, but from an ape-like species, and the Victorians shuddered to think they were once such a lowly base animal. I think I'd quite like to have maybe seen myself as an ape in a past life. Swinging in the trees, it's not all bad. The Victorians were just really uptight. And now we come to form and structure. There are four stanzas, six lines, 12 syllables per line. Notice these are all even numbers, which is ironic because Dowson does not feel even or steady or whole at all. And I'm just kind of wondering why he does that. At the end of each line, there's an alternate rhyme. So typically it follows the pattern of A, B, A, C, B, C. Although the rhyme is consistent, there's not really a standard meter. Most of the lines are iambic hexameter, which means each line has six metric feet. The first beat is unstressed and the second is unstressed. That being said, the poem doesn't stick strictly to this form which could represent Dowson's unpredictable, destructive behaviour. What's clever here, though, is the poem is so close metrically to being iambic pentameter, five metric feet. And iambic pentameter is a form typically used in sonnets and love poems. Again, the irony here is that maybe Dowson is saying his love with Sonara was so close to being fated and whole, but it never truly was or could be. I just want to leave you with one more symbolic fact. After Ernest's death, Oscar Wilde, the Irish poet and playwright, wrote, poor wounded wonderful fellow that he was, a tragic reproduction of all tragic poetry, like a symbol or a scene. 
I hope bay leaves will be laid on his tomb and rue and myrtle too, for he knew what love was. So when I read this quote from Oscar Wilde, I got really excited because all these plants are loaded with symbolism. Bay leaves have featured in myth and legend since ancient times. They represent honour and victory. They were crowned on gods and goddesses. Um, and even today, if we take um, Olympic winners and PhD students, they're also crowned with a, a laurel wreath. Wilde clearly felt that Ernest was a literary god. Then we have rue, which means regret, and then myrtle, which is symbolic of sensuality. It's though Wilde is saying, you can't know true love unless you know regret and sensuality. Wow. Well done, guys. That was a beast of a poem. Thank you so much for sticking with it. Like, subscribe, and comment your favourite piece of information below. If you want to get your hands on some extra notes, head to Patreon, come say hi on Instagram. And yeah, I think that's everything. So thank you again, and I'll see you next time.